With most Australian families unable to holiday overseas in 2020 and 2021 for obvious reasons, sales of ute-based large SUVs have boomed. After all, they are among the very few vehicles that are capable of doing it all, which makes them a great option for those looking to instead tour our great country. The Sangyong Rexton is one such model, with its midlife facelift arriving at the perfect time, ushering in revised looks, more technology, an upgraded engine and a new transmission. But does it do enough to challenge the best-selling Isuzu MUX, Ford Everest and Mitsubishi Pajero Sport? Let's find out. Before we do, I'm going to split this video into chapters with their time codes right over here. So feel free to skip ahead to anything that you're particularly interested in. And if you're on YouTube, there are markers in the timeline below to make skipping ahead even easier. But be sure to give this video a like before you do. As always, if you want to know more, you can read my detailed written review over at the Cars Guide website. So click on the link in the description below to go check it out. And if you want to stay on top of any of our upcoming videos, be sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel and then hit the bell icon to get notified when they're uploaded. With its facelift, the Rexton's entry-level EX grade was discontinued and with it, the availability of rear-wheel drive and a petrol engine. The mid-range ELX and flagship Ultimate grades have however carried over with their diesel engine and four-wheel drive system, but more on all that later. For reference, the EX was priced from an attractive $40,000 drive away, while the ELX is now $1,000 dearer at a still very competitive $48,000, and the Ultimate has become $2,000 more expensive at a just as impressive $55,000. Standard equipment in the ELX generously includes dust sensing lights, rain sensing wipers, 18 inch alloy wheels, puddle lights, keyless entry and roof rails. Inside, push button start, wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support and a six speaker sound system feature. And then there's power adjustable front seats with heating and cooling, heated middle seats, dual zone climate control and artificial leather upholstery. The ultimate you see here adds 20 inch alloy wheels, rear privacy glass, a power operated tailgate, a sunroof, a heated steering wheel, memory functionality, quilted Nappa leather upholstery and ambient lighting. So what's missing? Well, there's no digital radio or inbuilt satellite navigation, but the latter isn't a total deal breaker due to the fitment of smartphone mirroring, unless you're out in the bush with no reception of course. The only option for the Rexton is metallic paintwork for $495, with five of the six available colours commanding the premium. Well, hasn't a literal facelift done wonders for the Rexton? Its new LED headlight inserts, grille and front bumper combine to deliver what I think is a much more attractive and modern look. Around the side, the changes aren't as dramatic, with the Rexton getting fresh sets of alloy wheels and revised body cladding, which makes it appear tougher than before. And at the rear, the Rexton's new LED taillights are a huge improvement, while its tweaked bumper is a lesson in subtlety. Overall, the Rexton's exterior design has mercifully come at leaps and bounds, so much so that I'd say it's now one of the better lookers in its segment. Inside, the facelifted Rexton continues to stand out from the pre-facelift crowd, this time with its new gear selector and steering wheel with paddle shifters. But the big news is what's behind the latter, a 10.25 inch digital instrument cluster, which is standard range wide. It alone helps to contemporize the cabin. That said, the rather dim touchscreen to the left has disappointingly not grown in size, remaining at eight inches, while the multimedia system powering it is largely unchanged, although it does now have dual Bluetooth connectivity and useful rear cabin sleep and talk modes. The Rexton also has new front seats that feel pretty good alongside the rest of the interior, which is more premium than you'd expect, as evidenced by the high quality materials used throughout. The Ultimate Grade in particular is a cut above the competition with its quilted Nappa leather upholstery, which adds a level of suppleness that just isn't associated with ute-based large SUVs. Whereas the Rexton looks fresh outside, inside it's still looking a little bit dated, particularly in regard to that dashboard design. Although the center stack's physical climate controls are very much appreciated in 2021. But what do you think of the design? Let us know in the comments. Practicality wise, the Rexton has a solid cargo capacity of 641 liters, but you only achieve that by stowing the split fold third row using these very easy pull tabs just like that but 
If you want to access a full 1,806 litres of cargo capacity, you're going to have to also drop the 60-40 split fold second row, but that action annoyingly can only be done by accessing both rear doors. To create a flat floor, the Rexton is fitted with a parcel shelf behind its third row, which creates two levels of storage for you, but the parcel shelf itself is only rated for 60 kilos, so you do have to be careful with what you put on it. But when you do remove the parcel shelf itself, you have a small load lip to contend with, which makes loading bulkier items a little bit easier. Other things that are present in the boot are two bag hooks, You've got four bag clips and there's also a 12 volt power outlet on hand for a vacuum or something like that. Now, how does one access the third row? It's actually kind of easy. The second row tumbles forward and in combination with the large door opening leaves you with plenty of room to just slide on into the third row. And of course you can pull the second row down then at that point. The only problem is when you want to get out of the third row you can fold down the second row with this pull tab right here, but to actually get it to tumble forward again so you can walk out, you're gonna have to reach that latch again, which is kind of difficult to do. You can do it if you've got longer arms, um, but yeah, more often than not, you're gonna need some assistance getting out of the third row. As you can tell, the third row is clearly designed for young children and teenagers because as an adult, my 184 centimetre frame doesn't exactly have a whole lot of room. My knees are pressed up against the second row's backrest and I have to really kind of crank my neck and even so it still brushes up against the roof. So yeah, there's not a whole lot of room to move here. And unfortunately, the second row doesn't slide forward so you can't afford third row passengers any more leg room. Uh, it does recline ever so slightly so there is some relief there but certainly not enough. Now third row passengers aren't exactly treated to a whole lot, there's no USB-A ports or even cup holders and only the driver's side gets directional air vents with this side missing out. You do get this long shallow tray on the side though which is perfect for storing sausages, I don't know, it's a bit weird. Moving to the second row where I have plenty of legroom behind my own driving position and decent headroom as well. There is a small central tunnel, so there's plenty of footwell space to go around for three adults abreast on shorter journeys. Note, three top tether and two Isofix anchorage points are on hand, but only in the second row for fitting child seats, so plan accordingly. Amenities wise, there is a fold down armrest with two cup holders, which is perfect for our bottle. You also have a littered tray, which is perfect for storing something. Uh, also on the bottle front, the rear door bins are large enough to, believe it or not, take three regular bottles, which is pretty good. You've also got coat hooks up here next to the handles, map pockets on the front seats, and the rear of the center console has directional air vents, a 12 volt power outlet, a USB-A port, and a rather large cubby area. In the first row, this central storage bin is on the larger side. You've also got a 12 volt power outlet in there, which is pretty handy. And the glove box is also on the larger side, so you can fit more than just a manual in there, which is unusual. Uh, also, in the center console, you've got a couple of cup holders here in the middle, which is perfect for our bottle again. Uh, ahead of them are two USB-A ports. And in the Ultimate that we're sitting in right now, there also is a new wireless smartphone charger. And the front door bins are large enough to accommodate two regular bottles each. The Rexton comes with a good, if not comprehensive, safety suite. Advanced driver assist systems in the ELX and Ultimate extend to city speed autonomous emergency braking, brake based lane keep assist, blind spot monitoring, and rear cross traffic alert. And then there's high beam assist, a reversing camera, front and rear parking sensors, and tyre pressure monitoring. Meanwhile, the Ultimate also gets surround view cameras. In Australia, no matter the grade, the cruise control on hand isn't of the adaptive variety, despite it becoming available from factory with the facelift. And in any market, intersection assist is unavailable alongside steering assist with emergency functionality. Other standard safety equipment includes nine airbags, but disappointingly, none of them cover the third row. Of note, all seven seats now come with seatbelt reminders. Interestingly, neither ANCAP nor its European counterpart Euro ANCAP has assessed the Rexton's crash performance and given it a safety rating. So keep that in mind if it's important to you. While we haven't tested out in this review, the Rexton has added trailer sway control, which applies brake pressure if lateral movement is detected while towing. Speaking of which, the Rexton's brake towing capacity is a segment leading three and a half tons. 
As mentioned, the Rexton used to be available with two four-cylinder engines, with the now discontinued entry-level EX powered by a two-litre turbo petrol with rear-wheel drive. But with the facelift, the Rexton is now exclusively powered by a 2.2-litre turbo diesel with a part-time four-wheel drive system, which features a low-range transfer case and a rear differential lock. The 2.2-litre turbo diesel has been upgraded though, with its outputs having increased by 15 kilowatts to 148 and 21 newton meters to 441. For reference, the 2-litre turbo petrol develops more power at 165 kilowatts, but less torque at 350 newton meters. Better yet, the 2.2-litre turbo diesel's Mercedes-Benz sourced 7-speed torque converter automatic transmission has been replaced by a new 8-speed item. While we're used to seeing updated, facelifted and new models arrive with improved fuel consumption, the Rexton has gone down a different path. Yep, the improved performance of its 2.2-litre turbo diesel four-cylinder engine has unfortunately come at the cost of lower efficiency. On the combined cycle test, it now delivers 8.7 litres per 100 kilometres, which is 0.4 litres more than before. In our real-world testing though, I averaged a much higher 11.9 litres per 100 kilometres, although a better result would have inevitably been achieved with more highway driving. For reference, the Rexton comes with a 70 litre fuel tank, which equates to 805 kilometres of claimed range. Like all Sangyong Australia models, the Rexton comes with a 7 year unlimited kilometre warranty, which trails only the condition based 10 year term Mitsubishi offers. Rexton also comes with 7 years of roadside assistance and a just as impressive 7 year 105,000 kilometre cap price servicing plan. Service intervals are on par at every 12 months or 15,000 kilometres, whichever comes first, and cost a minimum total of about $4,070, or an average of around $580 per visit, if serviced annually. Behind the wheel of the Rexton, the first thing you probably want to know about is the upgraded engine. Again, we are dealing with more power and torque, so that is a nice little improvement. But what you notice is off the line in particular, there is that kind of initial hesitancy until the turbo spools up quickly afterwards. And what that leads to is this kind of a really peaky performance. It's not exactly smooth off the line. So particularly in first gear, once you get into second and third, it's not too bad. But uh, yeah, it could be a little smoother off the line for mine. Now, when you come to actually overtaking and making most of the performance, you can definitely tell the engine's a lot punchier than it used to be. So, you know, they've made some pretty worthwhile improvements there. Also, you've got a new eight-speed torque converter automatic transmission to play with. That's pretty good too. The gear shifts are nice and smooth. They're not lightning quick, but they definitely get the job done. And uh, the transmission's pretty responsive to inputs as well. So, yeah, definitely a step in the right direction. Where things aren't so good though is the brakes. The braking performance itself, don't get me wrong, is, is fine, it's acceptable for the segment, but the brake pedal doesn't have that initial bite you'd really like to see. You step on the pedal and nothing really happens. You do have to stick the boot in to actually get any sort of meaningful deceleration happening. So that is something that you're gonna have to uh, get used to. It's certainly taken some time for me to get used to it too. Now when it comes to handling, the Rexton isn't all that good. Again, you're not expecting it to be a sporty drive, it certainly isn't, but when you tip it around a corner, you definitely notice that there's a bit of uh, body roll to contend with. Uh, so that's something you do have to manage when you're going around corners. You also have 2,300 kilograms of curb weight to deal with as well. So, you know, it is a heavy beast and certainly drives like one. Now with the steering, the Ultimate that we're in right now has a speed sensitive uh, power steering system which is all very well and good when it comes to the weighting but either way at low and high speed it's just too slow. You take a lot of turns of the wheel to actually get the car placed where you want to go. Um, again that's not unusual for this segment of ute based large SUVs but yeah it would just be nice if the setup was a little bit more direct uh, particularly when you're doing common maneuvers like parking or um, u-turns and things like that it just would be a little bit nicer if you didn't have to work the wheel so much to actually go where you want to go 
Another source of frustration is the ride. Now, in this particular Rexton, you have double wishbones up front and multi-links at the rear, so an independent suspension setup, which is pretty cool, uh, with coil springs. Now, that is car-like, but it doesn't necessarily deliver a car-like ride. Again, you've got a ladder frame chassis uh, in this particular instance, and yeah, there's quite a bit of wobble going on. If the road surface is uneven, it definitely rocks side to side. And again, on the Ultimate, you've got 20-inch LA wheels, and they really do pick up at all those road imperfections. So again, in the segment, it's okay, not great. Um, you know, overall, if you compare it to a car, obviously very, very different. But yeah, certainly in the segment, it's not an amazing ride, but definitely one you can live with around town. But uh, yeah, probably not the best there. Now, one other thing to be aware of are the noise levels. Again, you've got a diesel engine up here, and it is one of those diesel engines that makes quite a bit of noise under load. So as we come up to accelerating right now, you can probably hear uh, how much it penetrates the cabin. So it's something to be aware of. Again, you're not expecting the Rexton to be whisper quiet. It certainly isn't, but um, yeah, that engine noise pretty much drowns out uh, a lot of uh, other noises that you might hear, like wind and, and tire noise. And, Unfortunately, the six speaker sound system that's on board uh, isn't the best, so it definitely doesn't do a great job of uh, counterbalancing uh, all that noise you're hearing from the engine. Now, if you're keen to hear how the Rexton performs off-road, stay tuned for our upcoming Adventure Guide review. The Rexton is somewhat of a sleeper in its segment. It certainly doesn't get the same level of attention as the MUX, Everest and Pajero Sport do, but it arguably deserves to be in the same conversation. After all, it caters well for families and more or less does the trick on and off road. And on price alone, it should be on the short list of more buyers. But what do you think? Is the Rexton a winner? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget, there's even more detail in my written review, including a breakdown of the upcoming overall score on the Cars Guide website. Thanks for watching.